How do we manage housing affordability? Are there any zoning tools that we can use to help with that? How do we deal with flooding with brownfields with access throughout the area, with in general mobility in the area? So all of those are things we've at least personally heard and we know we'll be tackling during the discussions as we move towards new zoning. So this is the project area for those who can't uh, see it very well. It starts really where the uh, Swannanoa comes in, uh, down the south end, includes uh, uh, most of the eastern side of the river and the Belgium site, and runs up through the seven acre salvage yard slash public open space site um, uh, there just past the bridge. Um, it does extend a little bit up the hillside so where those properties will be significantly affected by the development that happens down below them. So you see it comes a little bit up uh, Route Street and, and uh, up Clingman, for example. So our team uh, includes uh, principally the, the my uh, company's offices. Uh, Code Studio is out of Austin, Texas. Uh, we spend all of our time uh, writing zoning and subdivision ordinances for people. Um, we are engaged right now all around the country. Our largest project is the entire city of Los Angeles. So this one seems like a great little project area when we uh, compare it to that. Um, we will be responsible for managing this project. I'll facilitate the majority of the meetings on it. We'll actually do the zoning language and the code writing. But we need a little support when we run our charrette week. And so that week we'll be bringing David Loewy, who uh, does market and fiscal analysis for us. Uh, Keith Covington and Lee Jones, uh, David is out of Atlanta, by the way, Wall Consulting Group is out of Atlanta. Third Coast Design is in Nashville, Tennessee. Uh, Keith Covington and Lee Jones will do the urban design for this project. Um, they worked with us in Haywood, if you uh, encountered them there. Uh, Joel Mann from Nelson Niagara, also out of Atlanta, will be coming to help us, uh, especially from the sounds of things, with parking. Um, uh, I've sort of shared a little bit about Code Studio already, but uh, basically I've been doing zoning work for about 30 years now, so um, we've seen a lot of flavors of this stuff, and uh, we hope we bring some good ideas to the table, but we're always open to some additional new ideas. What is a form-based code? Well, the fact of the matter is, um, uh, when we first started zoning, we were worried about things like tanneries being next to single-family houses. So old Euclidean zoning focused a lot on separating uses. This goes over here, this goes over there. So we got little pods of housing, little pods of commercial development, little pods of office, little pods of industrial. But we weren't very good at mixed use. And so existing regulations aren't really terribly good at mixing of uses. River Arts District is a great example of a, a wide variety of kinds of things. You've got retail in there, you've got arts, got industrial still in there, there's all kinds of things in there. Um, it is typically more visual. Uh, this happens to be a piece out of the uh, South Waterfront Code in uh, uh, Knoxville, Tennessee. Uh, uh, but usually it includes lots of pictures, and the pictures really help because when code language was originally written, it was all for the attorneys. It was all to be interpreted and whatever else as text. And that is really difficult then to hand over to an architect or a landscape architect or a land planner or an urban designer and say, you know, come up with a concept for me. And they've got to go and translate all of those words into something visual. That's just not their world. So the form-based code is also typically a much more visual kind of document. When compared to conventional zoning, it's not that we lose use and density. Well, we may lose density, but it's not that we use controls on use. But they're just not the number one thing that we care about. The number one thing we care about in the form-based code is the character and form of what you see from the public realm. So not 360 around the building necessarily. Really the space that you would use as a pedestrian, as a bicyclist, as a driver down the roadway. Right? So it's the facade of the building, it's the streetscape, and the street itself. Those are the components that would typically go into a form-based code. So right now, this is your existing ordinance, and I think we pulled a great page with some graphics here for you. Uh, uh, and this is uh, paper. Uh, so just an example of, of the fact that it can get better. This one can be even better than that one if we, if we can figure out how. The fact of the matter is that form-based codes are focused on plan implementation. They are place-specific codes, and they are intended to implement particular 
particular ideas. As an example, uh, when we were working in Haywood, one of the ideas was um, an earlier idea that had been put in place in Zoning was to say no parking was required in the two little downtown areas that are along um, uh, West Haywood. And uh, that was great, except what came along with that was seven stories in height. And if we had left seven stories in height in those places, all of the two-story and one-story buildings that are there now would probably be replaced over time. And that was not what anybody in the community really wanted in those cute little downtown areas. And so we lowered the heights in those areas, and we increased the heights modestly in the adjacent areas as a way to deal with sort of the community's interest in the protection of those pieces. So the form based code can be about a lot of kinds of things. It is especially about shaping the public realm. This is an image from Chattanooga, and this is the real photo. You know, the rest is Photoshop after this. But um, uh, you can see some of the concerns here showing up. That's a university-built dorm building in the background. And the traditional main street is what you're standing on here. This is Martin Luther King. And this street has a lot of teeth out of its smile, right? It's lost a lot of buildings over time. But the pressure is now there. The university is knocking on its door. So what do you do for a place like this? Well, I think first and foremost, you fill in those buildings and you do a better job on the street itself. Right? A couple of those things are critically important to really getting to the final vision of things, which is a substantially improved, walkable street. We're no longer so worried about the intensity of those buildings back behind. This is a much better environment. We're not dealing with them. They are separated by a land use transition. They're screened by landscaping. So there are lots of ways that zoning can do the right thing for the streets and the arts district. We've just got to keep them through and get them in place. So the tool can be used to preserve and enhance. So there's a picture of the wedge. Fine. You might decide, yeah, that's, man, that one stays, right? So if you want that to stay, don't put seven stories of height on it, which would encourage somebody to take it down and build the seven story building, which they could make more money on. You can do incremental change, small, modest things, additions, and other kinds of things, or you can use the tool to actually totally transform something. So this tool can be used, just like all zoning, in a wide variety of ways, and it's up to us as a community, and as professionals on the staff and on the consultant team, to come up with the right balance of these various tools. So, some important things about zoning. Well, that's, uh, as we call it, red on the zoning map, right? Almost always commercial is red. So there's red on the zoning map. But this is also red on the zoning map. And if we actually care about whether it's this or this, we have to tell people so. So we have to control the form. This is the same use. It might even be the same square footage in the end. It might be all the same things, but it's not the same. So if we like one better than the other, we have to ask for this one. So how do you ask for this one? Well, you get the building placement right. That's very important. We pull the building up towards the street. When the building sits back from the street, we have wasted infrastructure out here. Where's the shopper? The shopper's in front of the shop windows in there. What's this? I don't know who this is for. I don't know who sleeps on those benches at night, but it's not anybody who's doing any good for these people, either in the adjacent building or for us as a community. So this is a much more functional, viable, economically valuable street front than this one, even though this one has a high investment in streetscaping. Parking location. Little Trixie on her big wheel is going to get creamed on this block. She's not allowed out of the house. She's got to drive that thing around the backyard, I guess. Whereas there is the same use pulled up to the street. Slightly different architecture, etc. But really, did we really mean to have all of those garage doors and driveways? It's an open question. Building height. This is a fascinating one. If you regulate height in feet, what do you get? You get Paris and Washington, D.C. You get South Lake, Texas. Right? One height. Everybody maxes up to it. If you regulate in feet and stories, there is some chance that buildings will actually come in at different heights. So it's a, a way of thinking about things that can be helpful. The main thing about Kyrgyz is you don't want too much difference, right? 
If we meant to keep this house, we should have stepped that building back. Right? We should have lopped a piece off of it on the side in order to be at about the same height as the house next door. Windows and doors. Well, you would think we didn't have to ask people to put windows and doors on buildings, but actually, <laughs> we do. This is Streeter Bill in Chicago. This is a highly walkable environment that is filled with a huge podium for a huge tower that's dead or in the wall. The final thing is use. One of the things that form based codes have sort of broken ground on is ground floor uses versus upper story uses. In the old days, we knew all about that. But that's kind of fallen by the wayside. Now we've gotten to the point where we understand we actually want residential or office in the upper floors. We can code for it separately from the retail on the ground floor. So one of the final things is the character of streets. This happens to be a street in Alexandria, Virginia. I don't know if anybody ever visited Alexandria. Great, a few. Uh, Alexandria is, in most people's minds, an immensely walkable, beautiful, delightful city. It, this street in the morning carries an immense amount of traffic into DC, and in the evening again, an immense amount back out. And yet, it is still a livable, manageable street. Part of it is parking management. That lane is controlled right there, so that later, uh, sorry, earlier in the day, while people are inbound, no one is parking in it. Right? Tow truck comes and yanks you out of it if you stay five minutes past, you know, seven a.m. in the morning or whenever they change it. Uh, so management is part of it, but also infrastructure is part of it. The fact that there is a safe place for the pedestrian to stop in the center of the street, the fact that we have street trees here, there are lots of good things going on here. So if you want clear, predictable results out of your zoning, if you want these streets with parallel parking, as in the top example, angled parking in the bottom example, or in this case, if you want these kinds of buildings, street fronting, certain height, etc., then that's what's got to be in your code, right? And if you're not showing that to people, then they won't understand what the rules do. Does anybody strongly feel like they really understand what the rules do in the River Arts District today? I don't get them yet. And, you know, I do this for a living. It's way complicated, way messy, and hard to understand. So, we're going to run a public input process that uh, is described by most people as a shred multi-day collaborative effort. It provides us with some very short feedback loops. It's basically I bring all my experts with me. Right? I don't have to wait and call them to get their report back or whatever else. They're right there. I can grab them. Somebody comes in to talk to me about something and we can talk about it together. So this collaborative planning workshop is what we're going to run in July. Uh, here's the example of the schedule from, from uh, Haywood Road. But fundamentally, it starts with uh, a Saturday morning public workshop and it includes us working throughout the course of the week before we leave town. We end with a work in progress presentation. If there were one thing you could come to, it would be the Saturday morning workshop. If you can't come, look on the sheet that we've got out front for one of those places that says Open Design Studio and drop in on us. We're going to be in the former Blue Kudzu space. I can't tell you where that is, but I So, the last time around, we ran the design studio at the bottom of the fire station there, uh, next to the library, right on Haywood Road. Uh, we spent time on the first day uh, that we're here studying the area. And on Saturday morning, we run a hands-on design session. This design session is critically important because it's where some of the key input from the community comes from. It's where people find out what other people are worried about. And that's a really helpful thing. If we all know what we're worried about, maybe we can avoid all those things we're worried about, or at least some of them. So after the hands-on design session, we have a report back in which each table that has been working on this individually reports back to the broader group. And what I hope would happen, it's happened for me each time so far, what I would hope would happen is that we hear a lot of similarity between what people want. Doesn't matter which neighborhood you came from, doesn't matter whether you're a property owner or a renter or a, a visitor. Um, many times we'll hear very similar things about people's expectations from here. And if we can get focused on those things where we have lots of agreement, right, then that helps us then 
hone in on those things that we really have to work on and figure out. The team goes uh, off after that session and starts uh, by brainstorming, talking a little bit about what we heard and trying to figure out uh, how to reach closure on things where there's clearly substantial disagreement. We start actually designing the kinds of walkable places that could occur. And by designing them, we get to understand what the rules have to be. This is critically important in the River Arts District because we're challenged by one additional thing that was not uh, in our way in Haywood Road, and that's flooding. We all have to understand what the impact of the flood rules are in building a new building. And so we're going to have to actually design some buildings and some projects that live within the flood rules and would meet the, the city's uh, uh, obligations under the federal uh, emergency management agency's obligations for raising the elevation of things for flood control. We run a series of
then we move on from there and actually prepare the Ford base code. So, I just want to show you a few things. We've dug into the city's GIS, we've asked for a few specific layers, and we made some maps. Some of you may have seen these out in the corridor. These are the same ones uh, uh, just produced small here on the screen. So first and foremost, our project area. And I think it's important to note where the existing parks and open space are in the area. Uh, this is going to be a key part of the future of this portion of the corridor. This is called a figure ground. What a figure ground helps us look at. The designers look at this especially to see patterns. What is the pattern? Well, you can see the fine grain pattern out in the neighborhoods changes substantially to these very large footprint buildings within the actual district boundary. So if you look where the project will actually happen, most of the buildings are quite big. Why is that? Because they're commercial and especially because they're industrial. So that's much of the existing footprint. Did we mean to continue that pattern? Do we mean to build new things that have this big a set of footprints? Maybe not. There's been some discussion about the rad lofts, the new plan versus the old plan. So there's lots of ideas floating around out there about maybe this is not the pattern for everybody in the future. The block pattern in the area. Part of why we can't get around Part of why we have wayfinding trouble, and part of why we don't really have a solid unified arts district, is because you can't get there from here. These blocks aren't cut up by streets anywhere. And half of us probably already know that it's filled with railroad and river and steep slope. <laughs> so there's no possible way that we're going to be able to get from A to Z here without rethinking some of the mobility and the connections. The street network itself shows very few crossings of the railroad, for example. And the mobility for other people. This is the bus routes and bike routes. These are posted out in the hallway as well. And the greenway system. These are, uh, they go through the area. Uh, they go past the area. Um, uh, but they're not really servicing the area. And so we'll be looking at these ideas as well. Finally, probably the single most important map, this is the topography together with the flooding. So I don't know that you can see the topography very well, but there is a version of this map uh, out on the wall out there. You can certainly see it here, these brown lines of the topography. The more lines you have, I believe those are five foot contours. So every line is five more feet. So we're talking in many cases of, of a hundred plus foot drop coming off of those river bluffs. So those places become fundamentally unbuildable at a certain point. And so it radically impacts. When we just look at things in 2D, we're probably missing part of what the, of, of understanding the project area. Right? So some of this project area, especially out at the outside edges where it goes up kind of the valley wall, we're going to have to look at these things three-dimensionally. We're going to have to understand what the slope bring to the name. Um, the land uses within the project area, uh, in fact, most of it is commercial and industrial today. Um, there's a big piece of community services down on the bottom where the school is. Uh, on the west bank of the river is actually, I believe Duke Energy owns that, so we painted it green even though it's public services. It's clearly not going to be utility land. Uh, the zoning today is mostly river zoning. There is uh, this lighter purple color that you can see uh, that is uh, commercial industrial, um, but most of the project area is made up by the so-called river zone, which was really adopted fundamentally to make the place mixed use and to connect a set of guidelines <coughs> to the zone. So, next steps. The charrette schedule that's sitting out on the table out there looks like this. Again, that Saturday morning session we'd love to see you at. Monday night and uh, Wednesday night for the closing presentation. If you have time for all three of those, it'd be awesome. Where it says Open Design Studio, you can drop in and see us talk about a particular property or a particular problem that you're concerned about. The lunch and learn sessions are listed there, market dynamics on the first day and the art of artists on the second day. So uh, this is our big push is during the course of this week. Doesn't mean this is the whole project. 
doesn't mean this is the only time we provide input. But the more we get here, the better off we'll be. We're running this code off right now. The charrette will be in July. Uh, the drafting and discussing of the code takes a fair while. Um, it takes us a while to write the charrette report after the charrette and then get that confirmed and begin to draft in the code. Then we work, we have an advisory committee and we'll work with our advisory committee and the staff on the first draft and then it will become public. We'll come back out and present it and uh, share it with you. And at a certain point then, it will go into the formal code adoption process through planning commission and the city council. So if you have comments or questions, there is a web page for the site. It's at rad.code-studio.com. Um, and hopefully we put that on one of our flyers or something else out there. Um, there is a Facebook page that's used as much as anything just to provide announcements to people. So if you want to see those, feel free to sign up on there. Uh, Sasha is our project manager, and uh, we will post the show on this project page sometime tomorrow uh, so that people can get access to it. Mm -hmm. So um, with that, I would like to encourage you to go back out, look at the maps that are taken up out in the hallway, talk with one of the staff members about your initial concerns, figure out a time when you're going to be coming and getting involved with us during the course of the show. Thank you very much for coming tonight.